All right, grab your Bibles for some breakout. People be running all over the place around right here. Grab your Bible. Open up to Job. The book of Job. Yes, Lord, there's something up in here. Ooh. chapter 1 Job chapter 1 so you got it when you get it beginning at verse 1 there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil and seven sons and three daughters were born to him also his possessions were 7,000 sheep 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in, of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. You can be seated. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, this is a Bible study. Since you don't come, to, you know how to finish it. Since you don't come to Bible study, pastor bring Bible study to you. And I want you to let me give you my subject and my text at the end. Y'all supposed to say, okay. okay. I gave you the starter story here from Job. Because I want to talk about Job for a little bit today. I, this is a study that I want to talk about, some lessons I've learned from Job. I want to look at Job because Job encounters and faces a tragic situation. Here's a man who, uh, the Bible gives us a great conclusion about him, deduction about him. He's blameless, he's an upright man, he fears God. He hates evil. He has 10 kids. And he's a wealthy man. He's got thousands of sheep and camels, oxen, donkey. He lives in a large house. He must live in the Mitchellville of his day. <laughs> but one day, something tragic happens. Matter of fact, a series of tragedies happen. I wanted to talk about this because... As a pastor, I've seen a lot of tragedies. I've faced a lot of tragedies. I've counseled a lot of people who've had tragic experiences in their life. And I thought, uh, when I looked at Job, I see this man has a series of things beginning at verse number 13. It says in chapter 1, verse 13, that there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house, verse 13. Then verse 14, and a messenger came to Job and said... The oxen were plow plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they've killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. He says, Job, you know, all of those oxen and donkeys that you had, some thieves came and stole them and they killed your servants. And I was the only one that was able to escape and get away and I've come to tell you. Wow, that man is yet talking, verse Number 16 says, while he was still speaking, the doorbell rang again. 
another came, also came and said, the fire from God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. So here he's facing the fact that his oxen and donkeys are gone. Now his sheep have been consumed by a fire that fell from heaven and it's killed the sheep the fire killed the sheep and the servants and just as one servant escaped to tell and verse 17 says while he was still speaking another also came and said the Chaldeans formed three bands raided the camels and took them away the camels update Mike camels <laughs> guess what day it is <laughs> those creatures They took the camels and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. It's a pretty horrible day. But that's not the end of the story. Verse, six, verse 18 says, while he was still speaking, another came and said, with even more devastating news, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. Job, all of your kids are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and here's what blesses me about Job, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. There's gotta be a level of maturity in you that when you face that kind of tragedy, you can still worship God. Some of y'all can't worship God and you ain't had no tragedy in your life. You ain't had nothing devastating happen. But ultimately, the goal and the assignment of our church is to bring you to a place of spiritual maturity that you can worship God regardless of what kind of circumstances you face in life. If you worship God, you want to be in worship, you want to give God the praise, you want to be in church, you want to be around the saints of God, you want to be in the kingdom of God, you want to do the will of God, regardless of what happens in your life. Job blesses me because he says right here, the Bible says that he fell on the ground and worshiped God, and out of his own mouth, verse 21, look at verse 21, it says that Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return, verse 21. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This man blesses me. I'm honored by, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed by his fortitude, his attitude, his spirit. And to think that that wasn't, oh, hold up, look at verse 22. Can I talk, can I read verse 22 while I'm here? I told y'all this was Bible study. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And here's a man who had a series of events occur. Thank you, whoever you are, I love you, I appreciate it. Here this guy had a series of events happen to him, but he didn't charge God. This is a very significant thing. I want to talk about it. I want to talk to you about it because all of you at some point in life are going to face some Job-like circumstances. I know you don't want to hear this at the first of the year, but I'm going to just follow me till I get to the end of this little message. Just walk with me through the scripture. I promise you at some point in life, you don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to research it. You don't have to invite it. Trouble, tragedy, problems going to show up at your doorstep uninvited. And the question is, how are you going to respond? And a lot of where you are spiritually will reflect what your response will be. Some of you will be mad at God. You won't talk to God. You don't have nothing to do with God. When you have a little trouble, a little trial, some of you are going to quit church, not come back to church. Some of you are going to start cussing and calling people names, and you're just going to lose control. Because you're doing that already and you ain't had no drama. <laughs> what made Job's problems even worse is chapter 2. Slide down to chapter 2. And verse 7 says that uh, Job was struck with a case of boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. From his foot to his head, he had boils all over his body. He got sick. And then to think that that wasn't bad enough, verse 9, his wife started talking. <laughs> I'm right here in the Bible. I'm not making it up. <laughs> verse 9, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. She, she say, she's saying, here's what she's saying. She's saying, why are you still believing in a God who would allow all this to happen to you? 
Y'all got some relatives that think the same way. Shortly after all of this happens to Job, three of his so-called friends come to visit him. And the Bible says that Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, that's their names. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. In chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, I'm not going to read it, jot it down if you're taking notes. And they sat with Job for seven days and never said a word. Didn't say nothing, just quiet. I, I applaud them because when they started opening their mouths, that's when trouble started. And y'all do know sometimes Christian people mean well when they come into tragic things, but they don't, they don't always know what to say. Some of you need to learn the present, the ministry of silence. Learn the ministry of being present without saying anything. Don't come when somebody didn't lost a loved one talking about God needed a flower in heaven. And he came and plucked from the garden on earth. Shut up. Just be quiet. You, you don't know what to say. Shut up. Just be there. When they start talking, they start pointing the finger at Job. But everything that they say points the finger at Job. Job, you got a problem. Job, you sin. Job, your children sin. Job, this, Job, that. And we know later on from the end of the book of Job that God says that what they said was untrue. God said to, to uh, testify, it's recorded in Job, where Job, uh, God says to these fellows, these three, three fellows, what you all said about God was not true. So I thought I ought to talk about you, with this with you because this whole issue raises the question, the reality of a question that people are often asking. I looked at the stuff that happens in our paper and in the news and in the world today, the plane that crashed last Sunday and they're recovering the bodies from out of the sea, the um, uh, Columbine situation, kids and parents and murders. And, and ultimately it raises the question of why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? I wonder if y'all ever had that question. Anybody can honestly say they had that question. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And, and we can conclude that this would be the case with Job. Because Job, the Bible tells us Job was blameless, upright. He feared God. He hated evil. He prayed regularly and interceded regularly for his kids. This is, out of all the people, this is a good man. And so we want to raise the question, what why does God let bad things happen to good people? You can think of some people that some horrific things happen and you want to say, why God let that happen to them or to you? The question is asked. The problem with the question is that it makes some bad assumptions. Maybe can I rewind and give that to y'all again? The problem with the question is it raises the question in light of some bad assumptions. The first bad assumption is it's assumed that good people deserve good things. We, we want to say that when something bad happens to a good person that God ain't fair. Now, I want y'all to understand I've drawn a conclusion that ain't none of us good. Let me thank the 17 people for that affirmation. Ain't none of us good. We know how to dress good. We know how to look good. But behind the facade of what we look like, we ain't all that. Yeah, we, we judge a good person on the basis of what we see. But here's what Isaiah 54 and 6 says. Jot it down. Don't have time to turn there. That our righteousness in the eyes of God is like a filthy rag. Our best is dirt to God. Our best is dirt to God. We ain't all that good. And while I'm on that point, look at your neighbor. Say, you ain't good. You ain't nothing. <laughs> Go ahead, tell them. Tell them with an attitude. Eh? Tell them, I might not know everything about you, but I know you ain't all that you are perpetrating. <laughs> Y'all do know black people know how to perpetrate that they are better than they are. 
But here's the other thing. Let's be honest. Come on, talk to me. Have I lost y'all yet? Don't check me out yet. Stick with me for just a moment because I need to tell you one other thing about this point that I think is very important. And the reality is we think that when people are good, they deserve good. But we've already concluded that ain't none of us good. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And our righteousness, our best is filthy rags to God. The other point about this thing is we think good people deserve fairness. That's what we say, God ain't fair. Come here, can you come here, just come here a little closer. I don't want God to be fair. Did I tell y'all that the other day? I'm trying to drill this in your head. I don't want God to treat me fair. I don't want, to, I don't want him to give me what I deserve. <laughs> there y'all go acting like y'all don't have it but come on and be honest don't nobody in here want God to give you what's fair for you if God had given us fairness we'd all be in hell right now but somebody ought to thank God that he's not fair somebody praise the Lord God I'm thankful that you're not fair I'm thankful that you didn't give me what I should have gotten it's a bad assumption to assume and to even raise the question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Because we ain't good and God ain't fair and I don't want him to be fair. He woke me up. I didn't deserve to be awakened this morning. He kept me all year. I didn't deserve to be kept. He healed me when I get sick. I didn't deserve to be healed. He put food on my table. I didn't deserve the food on my table. He is better to you and I than we deserve for him to be. Somebody look at your neighbor and say amen. amen. So the reality, the fact is, I don't want God to give me what's fair to me, but that's not the only thing I want to say. Bad things, we assume, only happen to bad people. The scripture teaches this. Listen carefully. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. God makes it the sun to shine and rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. In other words, life happens to everybody no matter what status you're in. He makes it rain on so-called good people and he makes it rain on so-called bad people. He causes the sun to shine on both. So we should not come to adopt some attitude or some mentality that makes us think or have the, uh, the mentality to think that there are some people who don't deserve certain things or they're too good. No, 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 no. Let's be clear. That's not the situation. Tell your neighbor. That's not how it goes. Tell your neighbor it rains on the just and the unjust. So what's happening here with Job? What is the, what is the lesson? All this... These problems happening in his life. Let me tell you something. Unknown to Job's friends, and also unknown to Job, and also unknown to you, is that there are things going on in the heavenly realm that affect your day-to-day -day life. Boy, y'all missed a great spot to say amen right there. Y'all got to get that in your get, get that in your heart and your head. It is be it, there are spiritual powers that we are wrestling with. There are demons and there are devils that are involved with orchestrating the things that's going on in your life. And it's very important that this is going on and the devils, the demons have approached to God. Matter of fact, look at chapter one. Can I go back to Job chapter one? Can y'all slide back to Job chapter one? I'm almost finished. Verse 6 says, chapter 1, verse 6 of Job, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Verse 8 is a critical point. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and hates evil. I like that verse right there. So Satan answered the Lord, listen to what Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hand, and his possessions have been creased in the land. But now, 
stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and I, I, he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on this person, on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Y'all got to understand this, that there are things going on in the heavenly realm that affect your everyday life. So what has happened in the Job is the result of the enemy. It is the devil that has come and created this havoc in hell. Look at chapter 2. Can I read chapter 2, the first six verses here of chapter 2? Not only did the devil approach him, uh, God, once he approached him a second time. Verse number 1 of chapter 2, uh, Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Again, he did. And Satan came also among to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And he still, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will surely curse you to your face and the Lord said to Satan behold he is in your hand but spare his life and so you know the rest of the story it goes on the devil goes and strikes him with a case of boils his wife starts talking foolishly but I love and appreciate Job because he still worshiped God regardless of what happened in his life <clears throat> so the question is that I want to answer today I want to answer this question for you and I want to give you four simple points as to what's the answer to this dilemma. I want, I want to uh, give you these points about why God allows horrific things to happen in your life. Here's number one. I'm glad you asked the question. Number one, you need to understand that God is not the author or the creator of your drama. Can we get that straight? Write that down. He is not the author or the creator. How do you know that, Pastor? Because James 1.17 says, James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift comes from God. That tells me that if what comes is not good and perfect, it didn't come from God. Tell your neighbor, if it's not good and perfect, it didn't come from God. But hold up. So then how did it get in your life? It may not have come from God, but it had to get permission from God to come into your life. You say, well, what's the difference? The difference is, if you are not able to handle that which the devil has orchestrated in your life, God will cut it off before it gets in your life. But if it shows up in your life, it's an indication that God knows he's already put enough in you to be able to handle what it is that you have to go through. Somebody better go ahead and give God some praise. Somebody better thank God that whatever you're going through, he knew you had enough inside of you to deal with it. If he knew you couldn't deal with it, it wouldn't happen. I can't get no help up in here. If he knew it was too much for you, he would have cut it off. But the fact that it showed up at your doorstep is an indication that God said, go ahead, she can handle it. I'm looking at God and giving him praise for every drama and every situation and every burden and everything that came in my life. I'm thanking God that he thought enough about me that he allowed it in my life. He got to get a devil permission. You ought to be proud that the devil came to God one day and the Lord said, have you considered my servant John? Put your name there. That God thought enough of you to let the devil bring something in your life that God knew you had enough to withstand. Here's my second thing. That's the first thing. God's not the author, but he had to permit it. But he permitted it because he knew you could handle it. Here's number two. God allows these tragic things for his eternal purposes. Somebody say eternal purposes. Now I want you to roll over to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. I want you to um, flip your iPhone, your iPad, to Romans 8. I want to stay here for a couple minutes because verse number 30 says, God predestined, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. 
there are some things God allowed in your life that you may consider tragic or bad because he has eternal purposes in mind. What you're talking about, Pastor, what he's after is getting you glorified. But before you can get glorified, you got to get justified. But before you get justified, you got to be called. And in order to be called, you had to have some drama to help you be able to hear that he's calling you. Y'all might not want to admit it, but the reality of the fact is some of you never turned to God until you had some tragic come in your life. If all hell hadn't broke loose, if you didn't lose your job, if you hadn't been through a divorce, if you hadn't been hurt, if you hadn't been sick and the doctor said you were going to die, if you didn't have some tragic come in your life, you wouldn't have even come to God. But it's the fact that you came to him because of the drama that was in your life. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I know that's right. I would have walked, I would have kept going in my pace I was going. I would have kept living the way I was living. I would have kept doing what I was doing. But drama showed up and something came into my life that taught me I needed something to help me through this tragedy. Help me through this pain. Help me through this hurt. Help give me answers to things I could not answer. I needed help. So he allowed it for his eternal purposes. God's ultimate purpose is for you to get into relationship with him. Some of you here right today are in tragic situations. You got all hell breaking loose in your life. You need to understand that perhaps God has permitted it because he's calling you to himself. Jesus Christ who died on the cross and was buried and rose again for your life. For your forgiveness of sins has perhaps permitted it in your life so that you might respond to his voice. If it didn't come, you might not ever hear his voice. But drama has a way of helping you hear God. Here's the third thing. I'm almost finished. Y'all got my first thing? He's not the author or the creator. Number two, he allows it for his eternal purposes. But God, number three, will allow tragic things in your life for your character development. Y'all need to be clear, God is more concerned about your character development than your personal pleasure. He's not interested in you having fun or being happy. He wants you to have a character like him. He wants you to be spiritually mature. He wants you to have Christ-like character. And I discovered in life that tragic problems and issues and storms help make me more like Jesus. Let me thank all five of y'all that y'all keep clapping. I appreciate it. They ain't been clapping all day on this message, but I'm trying to give you something to help you for 2015. People don't understand. Thank you. I think you're the first person all, all day you're the second person all day, maybe the third. Thank the Lord, somebody, somebody resonates with the truth. Here's three. I'm praise, praise number four. Thank the Lord. Yeah. But if they knew that this is going to lead to a restoration thing, they would be running up here like crazy. Are y'all listening to me? Do you hear what I'm saying to you today? God wants to develop your character. Some of you keep going through storms and trials because your character ain't changing. You're staying hard-headed. You're staying rebellious. You're staying the way you are. And guess what? The storm will only get worse until you become what it is God wants you to become. God's not interested in your happiness. This is the hard thing to get people to understand. God is not some uh, genie in the, in the sky that you just rub the, 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 the bottle in abracadabra and you get everything you want. That's not how it works. He's interested in developing your character and the sooner your character develops, the sooner he can move you on to the next phase of life. Can I get an amen right there from anybody? That's what he's seeking to do. So here you are, God's trying to shape your character. By the way, and I, this happens most of the time. I, get, I find this issue with married couples because mar marriage, marriage, uh, 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 marriage has the ability to reveal character flaws. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, marriage will reveal your character flaws. 
it has the capacity to manifest that you ain't all you're cracked up to be. So listen, so, so people come to me with counseling and they say, well, the Lord wants me happy, so I'm going to get out of this marriage and move, over to, move on to the next deal. That's what they say. And they think I'm going to just say, amen, go ahead, get rid of that one, roll over to the next one. That's not what I say. I say to them, here's the deal. Here's how it works. Here's what's going to happen. If, if you have a character flaw here that you can't straighten out in this relationship and you leave this one and go to the next relationship, God will just raise up something worse in the new spouse. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. So you don't want this wife no more because she ain't giving you none. So you want to get out of that. Come on, brother, say amen. You know what I'm talking about. Now you want to go over to this other sister because you think she got it going on. She ain't even going to sleep in the same room with you, let alone hook you up. You want to leave this man because he's a mismanager of money. When you get over here to this new joker, he ain't even got no job. He ain't got nothing to mismanage. I'm preaching better than they're saying amen right now. God uses storms in our life to shape our character. Whatever you're going through in life, God uses this to mold you and to make you and get rid of the rough edges in your life. And the sooner you learn what he wants you to learn, the sooner he can move you on to the next level of life. My fourth and final point, first one was God is not the author of the creator of your drama. He permits it though. He allows it for his eternal purpose. For some of you here today, you got hell all around you because God's trying to call you to himself. For some of you, the tragic drama is there because he's trying to develop your character. But here's what Romans, oh, 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 I forgot to give you verse 29 for that point. A character developer. I, I'm running ahead of myself. I'm so excited that I didn't read verse 29. It says that whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He, he's already predetermined. You're going to look like Jesus one way or the other. So you might as well get with the program. Tell your neighbor, get with the program. Let me close with Romans 8.28. And we know. That's enough to shout about right there. And we know that all things, not some, not the majority, not most, come on, talk to me, somebody. Holler back at me. What? And last time I checked, all means all. All things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose here's my final point is that God will ultimately bring good out of whatever it is you're going through I know you're crying today and I know you don't see anything positive coming out of it now but I declare to you that I, it's not a lot of stuff I know but I know God and I know this about God that you might be crying today but by the time you come out of whatever it is that you're in it's going to be some good happening to you. You're going to benefit from it. You're going to be better because of it. Something is going to happen through the circumstances that you're in that God is going to bring something tremendous out of it. Somebody high five your name and say, he's talking to you right now. Look at him on the other side say, I think he's talking about you. God is working it out. He's orchestrating it. He's fixing it. He's turning it around. It looks horrible. It's painful right now. But God is going to bring something spectacular out of your circumstance. I know you don't understand it. I know you got tears running down your face. I know you're mad and angry. But my assignment is to tell you is to look beyond the moment and recognize we serve a sovereign God who had to give permission for it to come into your domain in the first place. And if he allowed it to come in, something good is going to happen to you.
Hold up. Job 42. Can I go back? I'm done. This is my last verse right here. My last verse, and then I'm going to give you my subject. This is my text message right here. This is the, I was going to read this first, but y'all wouldn't listen to me. If I read this first, y'all wouldn't listen to everything else I had to say. So I had to save this for last. Chapter 42. Now, all of Job is, we read the, the first two chapters, talk about all the drama he went through. The rest of the chapters, all the way up to chapter 42, is Job's friends talking. Is Job's friends talking, Job talking, and God responding. But God responds to Job with one verse that makes me want to shout. And God told me to tell you that the verse that God gave for Job is also for you. And it's chapter 42 and verse 10. And the Lord restored Job's losses. Somebody better get that in their heart right now. God gave back to Job what he lost. Somebody tell your neighbor he got restored. He got restored. This is our year of restoration. God told me to tell you everything that the devil has taken from you. God is going to give it back to you. It's our year of restoration. How far somebody say it's my year. It's my year. It's your year, it's your year, it's your season, it's your moment, it's your day of restoration. Everything that's been lost is the year of restoration. Everything that's been taken away is the year of restoration. All the stuff you cried about is the year of restoration. You're going to get your health back. You're going to get your life back. You're going to get your marriage back. You're going to get your job back. You're going to get your ministry back. You're going to get your mind back. You're going to get your heart back. It is the year of restoration. Hold up. That's that's not right. I didn't read the whole verse. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Hold up. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had. Somebody better go ahead and give him the praise right now. Somebody better have the mindset to say, he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy. Y'all better get ready. You better get in position. He gonna blow your mind. I told y'all you gonna catch up. Tell somebody I'm gonna catch up. All the stuff the devil took from me, I'm getting it back. All the stuff he stole from me, you getting it back. That's my job. That's my assignment. Is to tell you, tell him three or four people, shake three or four people's hands, say I'm getting it back. It's coming back, hey, twice. My subject is, you're gonna be restored double for your trouble. Hey. Double for your trouble.
Let me tell you something. I don't know how many years ago this happened, but several years ago, one of our members, a couple, wife got pregnant, and the doctors, through the tests, told her the baby was brain dead. Or there's something wrong with the baby's brain or something was wrong with the baby. And they encouraged her to abort the child. I was so proud of them when they decided to let the baby live. She carried the baby full term. And the baby was born and the baby lived for about six hours. And the baby died. They named the baby Miles. I preached a eulogy that we get miles from miles. We learned some lessons. But here she is. She's sitting in church right today. She lost that baby, but she got two other babies. Somebody say double for your trouble. Tell somebody double for your trouble. You cry, but you're going to get double for your trouble. He's going to wipe the tears from your eyes. This is the year of restoration. God is going to restore you double for all the trouble that you went through. Who am I preaching to today? Hold your hands up. I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name, mighty God. You're worthy, worthy, worthy to be praised. God, we've been through some hell. We've cried some tears. We had some challenges. But God, we receive this word right now that you're going to restore to us everything that we've lost. God, I believe it right now for the people of God. You're going to restore them double. You're going to give them back twice what they had in the name of Jesus. Twice the honor, twice the, the, the influence, twice the career, twice, twice God. Give it to them. Smear it on them. Give it to them in Jesus' name. We pray it, God. Give them that character. Give them what they stand in the need of. Dry the tears from their eyes and work the miracles in their life. We believe it. We stand on it. We decree it. We pray it. We accept it in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. We pray and go ahead and give God a shout and give him some praise and give him some thanks in Jesus name Somebody else want to get right with God? Come on down here right now. Somebody else wants to re- get, get, get saved, rededicate, get assurance. Come on right now while the blood is running warm in your veins. Come on right now and get right with God. Jesus died so you can have life. Come on right now, right now. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come. Come. Hallelujah. 
Praise the Lord. Look at God. Praise him. Somebody give the Lord a shout. Give him, give him some praise. How is yes, Lord, has to your will and to your will. I'll say yes, Lord. I will trust you. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit, when your spirit speaks, to me, speaks to me with my whole heart. It's the time. Give the Lord a shout for these souls today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wonderful God. It's not too late. Come on. All right, praise God. Anybody else want to come? This, this, the spirit of the Lord is here. It's best to get right with God right now. Amen. Come on and get right with him. Anybody else? Don't put it off. Don't delay it. This is the day the Lord has made. He spared your life. The Lord Jesus loves you. He has a plan for your life he wants to wipe your slate clean he wants to some of you need a church home tell y'all they tell your neighbor this here is a good church tell them this here is a good church you need a church this a great church that's right come on amen i see you it's a good church this a great church i'll say yes lord i will trust you
say yes. I'll say yes. Lord, yes. Lord, yes. I will trust you. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit, when your spirit speaks to me. When your spirit speaks. When your spirit speaks to me. Oh. Wonderful, that's good. Yeah, move down. We got more than we can handle. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, listen. The person standing behind you is a counselor. They're going to take you in the back. They're going to talk and find out where you are, what your need is spiritually. Some of you are coming to get saved. You're going to walk out of here with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you are saved, but you're backslid. And you need to rededicate yourself. They're going to lead you into a path of rededication. Some of you are unsure, and you need assurance. You're going to get assurance. You can come on. We'll take you. Come on. Hey, you're in good shape. Come on, bro. Some of you are already saved and you're coming to join our church. You are joining a great church. They're going to tell you what the process is. How you doing? Hey. Hi. So proud of you. God bless you, man. So proud. My, 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 my. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, let me pray for y'all. Father, in Jesus' name, I am so thankful for every last one of these persons. Thank you that they have heard your voice. They've heard your call. I want to pray today, God, that you forgive them and cleanse them and plant them and fill them with the power of your presence. Save and and restore God restore in every one of their lives what they need restoration in Jesus name Amen <laughs> wonderful give the Lord a shout give the 